Hi, everybody. Uh, this is Professor Dr. Sarhat Özekes uh, from Üsküdar University, Department of Computer Engineering. Today, we're going to talk about the data mining techniques and their applications. Uh, large scale is data uh, is coming from everywhere uh, in many different application areas. There has been enormous data growth in both commercial and scientific databases due to advances in data generation and collection technologies. Uh, some uh, areas uh, that uh, produce data can be uh, given like cybersecurity, e-commerce, uh, traffic patterns, social networking like Twitter, uh, sensor networks, and computational simulations. So here comes the question, why do we need data mining? Let's have a look at from first the commercial viewpoint. Lots of data is being collected and warehoused, especially uh, this is web data coming from Google, Facebook, Yahoo, and Amazon.com. So Yahoo has petabytes of web data and Facebook has billions of active users, as we all know. Purchases at department and grocery stores and e-commerce is another uh, commercial area of this topic. And uh, bank and credit card transactions has also lots of data opportunities for us. So the computers have become cheaper and more powerful. And because the competitive pressure is strong, uh, data mining provides better customized services for an edge. Uh, also, we can look from the scientific viewpoint, data collected and stored at enormous speeds especially from remote sensors on a satellite, telescopes scanning the skies, high throughput biological data, and scientific simulations provides, of, pro provides us uh, many data. So how much data do we create per day? Uh, the amount of data we produce every day is truly mind-boggling. Uh, there are 2.5 quadrillion bytes of data created each day at our current pace, but that pace is accelerating with growth of IoT, Internet of Things. Over the last two years, as we see in the figure on the right, alone 90% of the data in the world was generated. And we can say that uh, last 10 years since from 2010, the amount of data is growth 50 times. So uh, we can think that um, one uh, quantillion uh, bytes is 10 over 18 bytes, which we call the um, exabyte. So please think about the amount of data we produce uh, every year and every day. Uh, day in data, in a day, uh, we um, tweet uh, about 500 million tweets uh, and uh, we, we send around 300 billion um, emails uh, and uh, Facebook uh, creates around uh, 4 petabytes uh, of data uh, and uh, around 100 million uh, photos or videos are shared on Instagram and uh, by 2020 uh, 28 petabytes um, of data are provided just from wearable devices. Average time spent, uh, daily time spent on social networking is another interesting uh, example about the amount of data we're collecting. Uh, minutes per day and the years, the graph is given in this figure. We see that uh, starting from 2012, the amount of uh, minutes per day we spend on social media and social networking in, is increasing. And um, around more than uh, six, uh, 60 minutes per day, we see that there's an increase uh, last seven years, this last seven years. Yeah. So uh, last year in 2019, uh, a person, an average person, was spending uh, more than 150 minutes per day in social networking. And the data never sleeps. Here we see a um, minute of a day, how many, uh, how many data, how much data we 
provide in different social uh, platforms in a minute. Here we see some um, numbers from YouTube uh, and Instagram and Twitter, how many users send tweets uh, and Skype and uh, Airbnb and Uber and Tinder are mostly used social media platforms are seen in this figure uh, so that uh, we can see that on the left the amount of uh, data stored in uh, last years are uh, growing uh, and incrementing. Average time spent in a lifetime is another interesting uh, information for us. Uh, an average person uh, in his or her lifetime spends um, uh, one year and eight months doing housework. And uh, that person uh, spends around two years in socializing and more than two years in shopping and uh, spends three years and seven months for eating and drinking and uh, spending uh, six years and eight months in uh, using social media. Uh, and also for watching TV, an average person is spending uh, more than eight years and more than 26 years we spent for sleeping. So we can understand from this, from this figure that uh, the time spent using social media is uh, coming closer to the time we spent for watching TV. So in a few years, uh, I think that we're going to um, exceed, we're going to spend much more time uh, to social media uh, when compared to uh, watching TV. And also uh, the big data uh, market size revenue is increasing uh, as, you, as you can see on the figure on the left. So uh, the forecast for the near future also gives us information that the amount of uh, big data market uh, size revenue is going to increase uh, in our, fear, in our uh, near future. So here we come uh, two terms, two types of data. Uh, the structured and unstructured data. Uh, the data is uh, stored in these two different types. The structured data is most often categorized as quantitative data, and it is the type of data most of us are used uh, to uh, working with. The data that fits uh, fixed fields and columns in a relational uh, in a relational databases in relational databases and separate sheets can be an example of structured data, uh, like including names, dates, addresses, credit card numbers, stock information, geolocation, and much more. Um, examples can be given as structured data. And unstructured data uh, is most often categorized as qualitative data, and it cannot be processed and analyzed using conventional tools and methods. Examples of unstructured data include text, video, audio, mobile activity, social media activity, satellite imagery, surveillance imagery, and more. And unstru unstructured data is difficult to deconstruct because it has no predefined model, uh, meaning it cannot be organized in relational databases. Instead, non-relational or no SQL databases are most fit for managing unstructured data. And in this figure, we see that the amount of unstructured data is much more when compared to structured data. And we can say that 80% of data growth is unstructured, as you see here with green. So we have great opportunities uh, to improve the productivity in all walks of life and to solve society's major problems like improving healthcare and reducing costs, predicting the impact of climate, climate change, finding alternative green energy sources, and reducing hunger and poverty uh, by increasing agricultural production. So how can we do that? We have to follow the steps known as knowledge discovery process, uh, KDD. So at the bottom, we have uh, databases in various formats coming from various platforms. Uh, to uh, integrate that data, uh, we first have to uh, clean the data. 
and after that we have to convert them uh, put the put them into all uh, data warehouse same data warehouse and to find the test relevant data we need some selection tools on those data warehouse and after finding the uh, task relevant data we have to apply our data mining techniques which we're going to see a few in this presentation today and after data mining techniques, we get the patterns. And finally, the business analyst is going to analyze and evaluate uh, this pattern and uh, find the knowledge. So we have some uh, definitions about data mining. Uh, we can say that it's a non-trivial extraction of implicit, previously unknown, and potentially useful information from data. Exploration and analysis by automatic and semi-automatic means of large quantities of data in order to discover meaningful pattern is another definition for data mining. So is everything data mining? No, it is not. So what is not data mining? Let's, have a, let's give an example about that. Query of a web search engine like Google for an information like Amazon. This is not a data mining task. But what the data mining example can be given in this category, we can group together similar documents returned by that search engine's uh, results according uh, to their context. So this can be a task uh, given example to what the data mining is. And data mining uh, is a breach uh, between the statistics and artificial intelligence, machine learning, and pattern recognition. It draws ideas from machine learning and AI, pattern recognition, statistics, and databases, database systems. Traditional techniques may be unsuitable due to data that is large scale, high dimensional, heterogeneous, complex, and distributed. So we have uh, mainly two different tasks in data mining. The first one is the prediction. Use some variables to pr predict unknown and feature values of other variables. The other task is the description, to find human inter in, in, interpretable patterns that describe the data. So here we see four different um, application areas of data mining. Um, predictive modeling, uh, clustering, association rules, and anomaly detection, outlier detection are four different uh, tasks that can be performed using data mining techniques. Today we're going to concentrate on predictive modeling as we see in the right top. And another technique is uh, clustering to find uh, similar uh, data and put them into the same cluster. And other uh, important um, area for applying data mining techniques is to find the association, association rules between items like the milk and the diapers. And finally, um, one, and one other task to apply data mining is the outlier detection. So uh, the outliers um, here given in uh, red circles can be really important some um, tasks like uh, medical uh, decision making. Let's start with predictive modeling and concentrate on classification. Uh, this is about finding a model for class attribute as a function of the values of other attributes. Here we see that we have a data set on the left, which the class is given. Here, uh, each row, uh, gives us information about whether uh, this person is employed or not, uh, the level of education of the person, and the number of years at present address, and the class, the output, which is the credit worthy. So using this, we can uh, construct a tree like that, and um, after that, try to predict some credit worthiness about the newcomers. So to, to define the classification task, we can say that given a collection of records, which we call the training set, each record is characterized by a tuple, X and Y, where X is the attribute set and Y is the class label. And the task here is learning a model that maps each attribute set X 
into one of the predefined class labels Y. Here we split our data into two. On the left, we have the training set, and on the right, we have the test set. Um, you can see that uh, on the training set, we have the outputs, the class output, but in the test set, we do not know the outputs. So after applying this training set and um, executing some learning classifiers, we can extract a model and apply the test set into this model and try to find uh, the output of this test set, whether the credit is worthy or not. Here we have some examples of classification tasks. The first task is categorizing email messages. The attribute set can be the features extracted from email message header and content. And the class table, the output can be whether this email spam or non-spam. Another example is identifying the tumor cells. The attributes can be features extracted from X-ray and MRI scans. And the class, the output can be the, whether uh, this tumor cell is malignant or benign cell. And uh, another example is cataloging the galaxies. The features extracted from telescope images can be the attributes and the class label, the output can be the elliptical, the spiral, the irregular shaped galaxy. So we can classify our data into three classes. Other examples can be given as classifying credit card transactions as legitimate or fraudulent, classifying land covers like uh, water bodies, urban areas, and forests, etc., using satellite data, and categorizing new stories as finance, weather, entertainment, sports, or identifying intruders in the cyberspace or classifying secondary structures of protein as alpha helix, beta sheet, or uh, random coil. Let's uh, focus on uh, some of those examples. The first application can be the uh, fraud detection. The goal here can be to predict the fraudulent cases in credit card transactions. The approach can be using the credit card transactions and the information on this account holders as attributes. When does a customer buy? What does he buy? How often he pays on time, etc. The label past transaction as fraudulent or fair transactions, and uh, this transforms, uh, this forms the class attribute. And we have to learn a model for the class of transactions, and finally use this model to detect the fraud uh, by observing credit card transactions on an account. The second application can be a churn prediction for telephone customers. The goal here can be to predict whether a customer is likely to be uh, lost to a competitor. The approach can be to use detailed record of transactions uh, with each of the past and present customers to find attributes. How often the customer calls, where he calls, what time of the day he calls most, his financial status and marital status, etc. Label the customers as loyal or disloyal, and finally find a model for loyalty. And last example, the Sky Survey uh, cataloging, can its goal can be to predict the galaxy, whether star or um, to predict the class, whether star or galaxy of a sky object, especially visually faint ones, based on telescopic survey images. So in this example, we can have 3,000 of images with high resolution images. Then the approach can be segment the image, measure image attributes or features. 40 of them can, um, can be used per object and model the class based on these features. And finally, the success story can be could find 16 new high uh, redshift cursors. Uh, some of them uh, are the furthest, furthest objects uh, that are difficult to find, like this. Here we can classify the galaxies, whether in their early, intermediate, or late states. Uh, the techniques used for classif classification can be decision tree-based methods, rule-based methods, 
nearest neighbor method, neural networks, deep learning, naive bias, and Bayesian belief networks, and support vector machines. And we also have some uh, ensemble classifiers like boosting, begging, and random forests. Let's start with decision trees. Here we have our data set. We have uh, our um, persons, uh, whether they're the homeowner, yes or no, the, their marital status, annual income. Uh, and uh, the default borrower is going to be our class. So we're going to uh, construct a tree like that. And uh, one attribute is going to be in the root. And we have some splitting attributes. And uh, depending on uh, the answer of this homeowner uh, or their marital status or their income, we're going to find, we're going to give a decision. And after finding a decision tree like that, uh, when we have a newcomer um, or a, a member of a data set or a test set, um, we can apply this newcomer to our decision tree to find, to predict its uh, output. Here we see that um, the homeowner's uh, value is no, so we're going to follow this route from the tree. And then we're going to have a look at the marital status and find that it is married. So we can say that no, the assigned default is going to be no. Here in this example, uh, we uh, split our data into two parts, the training set and the test set, as I mentioned before. And using the training set, we uh, trained our model and then apply our model to test set. Some decision tree uh, algorithms are Hunt algorithm, one of the earliest algorithm decision tree algorithms, the CART, the ID3 or C4.5, and uh, SLIQ and Sprint are other decision tree uh, methods. So the question here is what about the design issues? What the design issues we have in uh, decision tree induction? So the first question can be, how uh, should training record be split? The method for specifying the test con condition can be depending on uh, attribute types and uh, measured for evaluating the goodness of a test condition. And how should uh, the splitting procedure stop? So we need a stop splitting criteria if all the records belong, on the, belong to the same class or have identical attribute values and the uh, early termination can be another state, of course. Um, depending on the attribute types, uh, we have some methods for expressing test conditions. Those types of attributes can be binary, nominal, ordinal, or continuous. And depending on number of uh, ways to split, we have two-way split or multi-way splits. Here we see some examples. On the left, depending on the gender, we have two-way split. Depending on the card type, here we see three-way split. And depending on the customer ID, here we see uh, more than three-way splits. The question here is, which attribute is going to be uh, the best split in each step? So the greedy approach can be used and the nodes with purer, uh, purer uh, class distributions are preferred and we need a measure of not impurity. What type of measures can be used to uh, determine the not impurity? These measures can be the Gini index, the entropy, the Shannon entropy, and the misclassification errors. So we use these measures to, um, this, to make a decision on which uh, attribute to use for split. The advantages of decision trees are inexpensive. It's inexpensive to construct. It is extremely fast at classifying unknown records, and it is uh, easy to interpret for small sized trees. It is robust to noise, and it can easily handle redundant and irrelevant attributes. And we also have some disadvantages for decision trees, like space of possible decision trees is exponentially large and the greedy approaches are often unable to find best trees in those cases. And it does not take into account interactions between attributes and each decision boundary involves only a single attribute. 
Another technique that can be used in classification is the bias classifier. This is a probabilistic framework for solving classification problems. It uses the bias theorem based on conditional probability. Here we see the example uh, bias theorem. Uh, this is on the left hand side, we have the conditional probability. It is the probability of y given x equals to the probability of x given y times the probability of y divided by the probability of x. Considering each attribute and class labels as random variables, we have a given record with attributes x1, x2, and uh, etc. going to xd, and the goal is to predict our class y. Specifically, we want to find the value of y that make, maximizes, um, given this attribute, to, max, to maximize the probability of y. So, can we estimate the probability of y given that attribute directly from the data? This is our question. So, for a given test record like x given as you found no, divorced, and income, uh, 120k of income, uh, can we estimate whether um, the evade status can be no or yes? This is going to be a conditional probability. Given x, we're going to calculate the probability of evade being yes, or given x, we're going to calculate the probability of evade being no. And then we're going to select the one with highest probability. So um, to find to calculate that, we're going to use that bias theorem given in this formula. And finally, we're going to select uh, the highest probability and uh, make a decision whether the weight is going to be yes or no. The next algorithm we're going to see uh, for classification is going to be the artificial neural networks. Uh, as you all know, we have neurons in our brain and a neuron receives input from other neurons, generally thousands of uh, inputs from neurons from through its synapses. Inputs are uh, appropriate, uh, approximately summed. Uh, when the input exceeds a threshold, the neuron sends an electrical spike that travels from body down the axon to the next neurons. As you see, we have the neuron bodies and we have the synapses and the dendrites and the axon is going to um, send an output to other neuron. Here we have a comparison of a biological neuron and the artificial one. In computer science, we use some methods that are inspired from nature. And this is uh, an example of that. This artificial neural network method is inspired from biological neuron. On the left, we see our cell body, the nucleus, and the output through this uh, cell body is sent through the axon. And we have dendrites uh, for the inputs. As you see, we have some um, input layer here, uh, having our different inputs represented by P1, P2, P3, and PR. And all those inputs are connected to a layer, which we call the hidden layer. And uh, those inputs are multiplied by the weights and added together, also we have a bias here. And then uh, we have some activation functions and the results of those additions are uh, sent through this uh, activation function, pass through that activation function, and finally we get the output. And that output is sent to other neurons, like the one we, uh, like the one we see in biological neuron. So an artificial neural network is specified by uh, three different types, three different um, specific attributes. Uh, the first one is the uh, neuron model. It is about the information processing unit of our neural network. And then we have the ar architecture, which is the set of neurons and links connecting neurons. Each link has a weight, as we discussed before. And finally, we have a learning algorithm used for training the neural network by modifying the weights in order to model a particular learning task correctly on the training examples. So the aim is to obtain a neural network that is trained and generalizes well. It should behave correctly on new instances on the learning task. 
So let's start with the neuron model. Here, as we said, we have the input values. And those input values are connected uh, to a neuron, to, to a uh, summing function. And we have some weights. So as you see, all those inputs are multiplied by those weights. And we add all them together. And we also have a bias. And then we pass, we pass this um, addition from an activation function, like here we represent it by a phi, and the output is um, calculated. So what type of activation functions we have? Here we see four different activation functions. The first one is a step function. It is about just a threshold. So if we have a x value, so smaller than uh, less than this uh, value it is going to be um, a negative value or it is going to be a positive value if our x value is greater than that um, value and then we have uh, the ramp function for a specific um, value it's going to be a minus value or for another specific value it's going to be a positive value and between that we have a, a linear increment like that and we have a nonlinear function, which we call the sigmoid function. Uh, so the output, the result of the sigmoid function is going to be between zero and one, as seen in this figure. And finally, we can also use a Gaussian model um, as the figure is seen here. And we can go with the network architectures. We have uh, basically two different architectures. The left, on the left, we see the single layer feed forward structure. Here we, 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 here we have the input neurons, input uh, nodes, and they are sent to the uh, output layer of the neuron. But on the right, on the multi-layer multi feed forward structure, we have a hidden layer here given here. So each input is sent to this hidden layer, and then um, the output of the hidden layer is sent to the output layer. And finally, we have the learning algorithms. Um, the mostly used learning algorithm is the backpropagation. Here we have two ways of operations. In the first way, um, the network activation is in the forward step, which we see by the green line. In this forward pass, the network is activated on one example, and the error of each neuron of the output layer is computed. And after computing this error, we're going to backpropagate our error in the backward pass. The error is backpropagated uh, from the output layer through the network layer, uh, and uh, the weights are updated. This is called the backpropagation learning. Here we have an example about that. In the input layer, we have three attributes, which are the age, the gender, and the stage. And here are the values of them. The age is 34, the gender is two, and the stage is four. And this input layer is connected to the hidden layer, and we have some weights between them. <coughs> These weights are um, initialized randomly in the initial step. Here uh, we see some uh, initial weights, 0 0.6, 0 0.2, 0 0.1, 0 0.3, 0 0.7, and 0 0.2. And um, after passing these input layers to the hidden layer, here we see some activation function, uh, which we know it from before as a sigmoid function. It's a nonlinear function. So these inputs are multiplied by the weights and added together and passed through a sigmoid function. And then the output of this, which is uh, 0.4, is going to send to the output layer. Uh, and uh, this output, 0 0.4, is going to be multiplied by uh, the weight uh, in this uh, connection. And also, uh, the output of the second neuron is going to be passed um, to the output layer. And also, we have the sigmoid function here in the output layer. So after all, uh, we calculate the output uh, of the first iteration as 0 0.6. But we know that the actual value should be 0 0.65. So the error uh, 0 0.05 should be minimized. And this error is backpropagated. And uh, this error backpropagation, after this error backpropagation, the weights are recalculated. And uh, after this updated weights, 
we are going to calculate the second iteration uh, and calculate the second output. And we're going to check uh, if there's an error or not. Uh, if there's an error, we're going to iterate it. If there's also um, still have an error, this is going to be iterated. And this iteration is continue until we minimize the error or the total number of iterations are satisfied. And finally, our neural network is going to be learned. Uh, we have some characteristics of ANN. Let's uh, discuss about those. Multi-layer artificial neural networks uh, are universal approximators, but could suffer from overfitting if the network is too large. Overfitting means uh, our network is going to be um, uh, executed too much and uh, learn about the noises also in the data. This is called the overfitting. The gradient descent may converge to local minimum. Our learning uh, method called gradient descent can be um, converged to a local minimum, but we're looking for the global minimum. So we're going to, we have to use, to come over this problem, we have to use the stochastic gradient descent. You can check for stochastic gradient descent to uh, come over this local minimum problem. Uh, model um, building can be very time consuming, but the testing can be very fast. And uh, ANN can handle redundant attributes because weights are automatically learned. And ANN can be sensitive to noise in training data. And finally, ANN uh, is, can difficultly handle missing attributes. So first of all, before using the ANN, we have to, before using every classifier, every classification method, we need some um, uh, pre pre preliminary techniques to handle the data, to remove the missing attributes, to remove the noise in the data. We have, of course, some uh, recent noteworthy developments in ANN, which we call the deep learning. Deep learning is a subfield of machine learning concerned with algorithms inspired by the architecture and function of the brain called artificial neural neurons. Uh, deep learning architectures such as deep neural networks, deep leaf networks, recurrent neural networks, and convolutional neural networks have been applied to fields including computer vision, speech recognition, national language processing, audio recognition, social network filtering, machine translation, bioinformatics, drug design, medical image analysis, material inspection, and board game programs where they have produced results comparably to and in some cases surpassing human expert performance. Here we see the figure showing uh, the neural network, the old type neural network, and the deep learning neural network. Starting from early 80s, we're using, as a computer scientist, we're using the neural networks. So as you all know, as we discussed before, we have the input layers, the hidden layer, and the output layers. We have also links carry signals from one node to another, boosting or damping them according to each link's weight, as we said. But on the right, we have the deep learning design. As you see, we also have the input layer and the output layer, but we have multiple hidden layers that processes the hierarchical features. To give an example, we can talk about a gentleman, which is George Washington, and we can input um, images of this gentleman into this deep learning neural network. Having this uh, data set of uh, images, the input layer can identify the light, dark, and pixel values. And then uh, the first hidden layer can identify the edges. The second hidden layer can identify combinations of the edges. And uh, the third hidden layer can identify the features. And finally, the output uh, is going to identify the combination and combinations and features and is going to give us uh, the output for George Washington. Here we see a figure representing um, the comparisons of deep learning and uh, older learning algorithms. Uh, the x-coordinate gives us uh, information about um, amount of data. 
as you see, up to this intersection point, uh, both uh, methods' performance seems similar. But after this uh, critical point, uh, we see that the older uh, learning algorithms' performances are not increasing so much, but uh, the performance of deep learning is really increasing too much. So uh, how do the data science techniques scale with amount of data? So since five and up to seven years, the deep learning techniques are uh, mostly used uh, as the increment in uh, big data. Uh, and how, how, how big data set we have is going to give us um, a good performance in using deep learning techniques. Also, we have some challenges uh, and their solutions uh, in deep neural networks. Uh, the challenges can be uh, the slow convergence of uh, deep nets and the sensitivity to initial values of model parameters and large number of nodes makes deep networks uh, sus susceptible to uh, overfitting. Solutions of those challenges can be large training data sets, advances in computational power like GPUs, graphical processing units, and algorithmic advances, new architectures and activation units, better parameters and hyperparameter selection, and regularization. Also, we have some metrics for evaluating classifier performances. Uh, we, we can talk about the confusion matrix given uh, on the left bottom. The uh, rows represent the actual class and the columns represent the predicted class. So if we uh, predict, if we correct the predict, the output as yes, it is called the true positive. And if we correct the predict, the class no, it is called the true negative. But if we uh, wrong the predict uh, the yes as no, it is called the false negative. And if we wrongly predicted uh, the class no as yes, it is going to be the false positive. And uh, the most important performance uh, metric is the accuracy, is the ratio of um, true uh, predictions. Uh, TP plus TN divided by positive and negative, all the data sets. And we also have the error rate is one minus accuracy. But for unbalanced data sets, we also need some extra measures like the sensitivity and specificity. The sensitivity is, can be calculated as uh, true positives divided by positive cases. And uh, in training, um, we can split the data into training set and test sets, but also we have a more advanced technique called k-fold cross-validation. In here, we create a k-fold partition of the data set, and for each k experiment, we use k minus one folds for training and a different fold for testing. And we're going to iterate this k times, and we're going to get the accuracy and the sensitivity averages of all those experiments and uh, give, a, give a final decision about the model. Also, we, we can use the rock curves, the repeating operating characteristic curves for visual comparison of classification models. If we have two models like M1 and M2, uh, and uh, we see the rock curves of those models, here we see our x equal y, um, function which gives us a random chance like uh, tossing a coin uh, but also uh, we have some uh, we have two different models m1 and m2 and which model is better we can make a decision uh, looking at this rock curves um, the uh, model having uh, area under curve value uh, the um, bigger higher bigger area under curve value that model is going to be much more better than the others so it is going to we're going to conclude that we can conclude that that model is going to have much more accurate um, performance in classifying task so in here we can uh, say that model one uh, has a better performance Uh, this is all for today. We discussed about uh, data mining and its application areas, and we discussed about the classification. 
which is uh, one of the most used technique in many areas like cybersecurity. And also we discuss about uh, deep learning. Uh, and um, I advise you to uh, go on with these techniques uh, that we have many different resources and many different uh, data sets in these topics. And uh, we're giving you some essentials and uh, writing some codes in Python in artificial intelligence course. So hope to see you next time. Thank you.